So why don't you give your top three predictions for the season finale of Succession, okay. and then by the time this airs, it will have, you know, the season finale <laughs> will have already aired, and then we can grade your predictions. I'll give mine, and you give yours. Okay. This is tough. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Are You Ready with Joanne Molinaro. This week, we're going to continue with the series we started with episode 55 with David Molinaro, the super talented artist who has made a career out of creating beautiful things to hang on people's walls. Well, meet Lisa Wynn, who creates beautiful things for you to watch on your phone. Lisa is a content creator and YouTuber who shot to viral fame during the pandemic by making short videos of the food she made and then shared with her neighbor. Like many folks who transitioned into more creative jobs during or as a result of the pandemic, Lisa had a nine to five. She was a paralegal, but she decided to put that part of her life behind her and double down, as she likes to say, on a career in food. She started her channel in 2020, It's Lisa Wen, which now has over four and a half million YouTube subscribers, something that usually takes well over a decade. At first, you might wonder what all the fuss is about. Lisa's videos are often shot using her iPhone, and she doesn't feature difficult recipes. Some of her most viral videos are of instant ramen noodles. But as you'll soon discover while listening to her tell her story, Lisa's superpower is her vulnerability, her innate talent for making us all feel a little less alone, especially when the world feels powerfully lonesome. Through her journey as both a content creator and a daughter, Lisa uncovers a profound truth that healing is most effective when we do it together. So without further ado, let's get into it. Hello. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, Lisa? I'm great. How are you? I'm thirsty, uh, so I am going to pour myself a drink. Thank you so much for doing this. Of course. Thanks for having me out in California and doing collab with me. Oh, it's the other way around. Thank <laughs> you for coming all the way to California <laughs> to do this with uh, me. I'm really excited about it. I'm going to take a quick drink. Mm. Hey. I'm glad you enjoy our very cloudy, somewhat rainy weather because I have not been enjoying that. <laughs> I like a little bit of chill because if it's too hot and I'm too sweaty, it's just too much for me. That is true. I would rather be cold than hot. Are you the same? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if that's just like a Midwestern thing. It could be. I, I mean, I was just with John and he likes it hot. Yeah, he's like, I like it when it's really hot and sweaty when I run. And I'm like, no, I like it when it's chill so that when I'm running, I'm not sweating as much. But. Yeah, I like uh, minimal sweat. <laughs> I love how the first five minutes of our podcast <laughs> is talking about sweat. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, I'm surprised it's not like TV shows or movies, like what we always talk about. Yes, yes, I well, we will talk about that. But before we get on to the pressing items of TV shows and movies... <laughs> We shall move off of the sweat conversation, um, and I actually wanted to hear more about the story behind the story. Um, before you became It's Lisa, how you started really in food, not necessarily in cooking food, but as I understand it, I think when you were Telehue, is that right? Mm -hmm. And... I think you started with mostly like featuring restaurants or other you know, preparers of food. Maybe if you could just tell our listeners you know, how you started, at least in your mind, in this sort of food world. Yeah, of course. Um, I've grown up as a foodie. Um, I'm Vietnamese, so my parents cooked amazing Vietnamese dishes. But I never really took the time to learn the recipes. I would just help them like peel the garlic, um, wash the veggies and things like that. So I liked food, but I didn't know how to cook it. And I was working a full-time job as a paralegal, and it was fun. It, it, was, it wasn't fun. <laughs> I don't know why I said fun. It, it wasn't a bad job. It paid the bills nine to five. It was a stable job. But I felt like something was missing. I felt like I wanted to do more. And so around that time... It was 2016, 17-ish. Restaurants were on Facebook, but not a lot. And there's no Instagram presence for any of them. I'm from Wichita, Kansas, so 
kind of it, it, it is Midwest. It's a bit of a smaller town, um, but not too small. Not like what people think of when they think of Kansas. Um, but I realized that the restaurants didn't have that. I had my Panasonic Lumix uh, camera, and I thought, hey, why not shoot videos at these restaurants? And I started actually off doing social media first, and I realized it then narrowed down to doing videos because I enjoyed doing that. So I didn't have any experience using the camera, just learning as I go. And it was kind of a win-win situation because I created Telehue Food. Um, so I was across Facebook and Instagram in the beginning. I would go to the restaurants and ask to shoot a free video for them. So they would get a free video. I would get to uh, have the assets for my channels. And then, um, yeah, I had content and they had exposure. And so it kind of worked out that way. And then I quit my job January 2019 because that's when I just wanted, I just loved this. I love going to restaurants and I loved filming them. And it wasn't really, I wasn't making a lot of money, just enough to pay the rent and the bills. Um, and But I just couldn't do it anymore. And I had a lot of support from my siblings. Like without their support, without them saying, hey, you know, go for it. If anything happens, we're here for you. Then I don't think I would have done it. But they, maybe they're just tired of my complaining, actually. Now that I think back, they're probably like, oh my gosh, Lisa's just complaining all the time um, about this. But did that, and then the pandemic happened, um, obviously, and I did not how to cook. I was relying on these food from these amazing restaurants. They're, I like to feature family-owned restaurants because they they don't have the budget big budgets to hire like a videographer or like a whole marketing team for the most part. So being able to go in and film those restaurants and provide some type of value was really fulfilling to me. And that's really, I think, why I went all in as well. And then, uh, yeah, restaurants shut down and I was, I didn't know what to do. And I was eating instant ramen every single day mm. um, because I didn't know how to cook. And, but it was fun because I was posting it to social media platforms and People were like, hey, try adding cheese to it. Try doing this and that. And I was doing all that, and people were getting value from it because it's entertainment plus providing some type of value. Um, but then, yeah, my body was breaking down. <laughs> it wasn't breaking down, but it was like, I don't know about this daily on every day. <laughs> situation. Like, great for your views and stuff, but, like, for let's take care of our bodies. So I realized at that time – um, I had to get over my intimidation of cooking. So I started boiling eggs, cooking eggs differently, cooking steak, things like that. Mm. And I've been sharing that journey. And in my videos, I like to show my mistakes and my failures because, one, it's a reminder for me the next time I just have to rewatch the video and see what I did wrong and then fix that. Um, but also just to show people that cooking does not go perfectly every single time. And it's okay to make mistakes because – you know, you'll just get better at it. Mm. And then here I am. Here you are. And you're no longer known as Telehue Foods, right? Correct. Yeah. So uh, as people started recognizing me more in public and things like that, they, I, it was looking back, I had to figure out how to separate Telehue Food from then creating a personal brand. So I decided to create the personal brand. Um at one point. And then Telehue Food is now rebranded to Chew On It. Um, I've taken on my friend Kyle as a partner for that project. And so we're still going out and filming family-owned restaurants. Like, I don't want to lose that part of it. So Amazing. Well, I want to go back to a lot of the things you said all the way from the beginning, which is you had mentioned that your parents cooked amazing Vietnamese food. What were some of the things that they were making that you remember as, wow, that's like my favorite thing? Uh, my favorite all-time uh, Vietnamese dish is bong riu. Um, it is a spicy crab seafood dish, and it's just like comfort in a bowl. Mm. And looking at it, there's clumps of like crab and things in it where it may not seem look that appealing, but as you eat it, it's just so good. Mm. And it's spicy, mm. um, comfort food. Uh, also, another dish that I really like is my mom's congee. She puts a lot of different things in there as well. It's really good. I think that there's almost nothing as comforting as mom's kanji. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I my grandma used to make kanji or juk as it's called in Korean. 
And it is one of the most comforting dishes. You'll, it, you, I know you've watched as many Korean dramas, if not more, as I do. But you know, when someone gets sick or they're feeling under the weather, that's when you spend four hours churning <laughs> the kanji so it's extra creamy yeah. and starchy. And then you like open the pot for your loved one and you just instantly feel loved when you see that steam and get that lovely bowl. Lisa is one of the most prolific and successful food content creators on YouTube. And as she described, the vast majority of her videos document her journey to become a better cook. I thought it was interesting that like many of us, it wasn't until we realized there was a need to cook, like we didn't have someone to do it for us, that we discovered how much fun it could be. You see all these kids on TV, like on Master Chef for Kids or Top Chef for Kids, who clearly demonstrate chef-level skills at the age of like eight, but also a real passion for being in the kitchen. I definitely had no such passion growing up, and as it turns out, neither did Lisa, and probably for very similar reasons. Why do you think it was that you never kind of asked your mom or dad, hey, can you show me how to make that? I think it was just always a chore. I just think that like, you have to do this. It wasn't anything I enjoyed doing because it was just something as a kid that I didn't find interesting. Mm. It was just like, make sure you have the garlic. Like, I think there's the punishment side to it. Like, if you don't do this, you'll get like in trouble. <laughs> and so I, I don't know. It's just not as fun, right? Uh, but I mean, I regret it. I regret not like paying more attention to um, their cooking and stuff. And it also was really quick. So my parents worked... Uh, sometimes three till three thirty p.m. Sometimes till five thirty. So uh, when I got home from school, they're like, make sure the rice is cooked, make sure the meat is out thawing. Like there were just really strict things that um, I just need to make sure it happened first before. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, <laughs> and then I'm on standby like during cooking if they need anything. Uh, but yeah, they worked hard and then got off work and then had to cook dinner for the family. And yeah, what did your parents do? Uh, they worked, um, so Wichita, Kansas is known for aerospace. Like uh, They build airplanes out there, so there's like Bombardier Learjet. Um, there was Boeing out there. And so they just worked uh, various jobs there. Mm. Yeah, mm. It's so funny how you say that cooking was viewed almost as a chore because I felt the same way. I get so annoyed when my father would be like, make sure that you make the rice. And if I didn't make it the right way, he would get so angry. And I'm like, this is such an annoying task yeah. um and so i think there was sort of this sheen of oh, this is just another thing as opposed to an opportunity to like learn from them um although i wouldn't say that my father is the best cook <laughs> <laughs> now was your dad a good cook like did you enjoy the food that he made my dad was a good cook yeah he helped in the kitchen which is a funny thing because if they had they had weekend parties all the time like people coming over to sing karaoke so he would help my mom prepare for the party, like cooking in the kitchen. But as soon as someone walks through the door, he like washes his hands and makes sure like they don't see him in the kitchen helping. And I'm just like, so dumb, right? <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. Um, and then the it also, I don't know, the punishment side is like a little bit scary because, um, I, I mean, not scary, but it reminds me of the story of when I forgot to put the fish out. And as a kid, you're not really thinking of things. So I put it under, in the sink. They're on their way home from work. And I turned the water on hot. And so running over the fish, oh, it's no. basically cooking it. And my parents came home. They're like, this fish looks weird. I'm like, yeah, that's, <laughs> I'm like, that's, I don't think they ever got it. It was that way to begin yeah. with. <laughs> like, this looks weird. But basically the hot water is cooking the outside and having this unpleasant like texture. But yeah. Yeah. I remember once I made, I was very lackadaisical with my rice and uh, cause I was annoyed because it was like my chore. And I was like, how come Jason doesn't have to do it? He was a boy. So he got off a lot of slack when it comes to kitchen chores. And so I had to make the rice every day. And I was so annoyed that I didn't rinse it. I literally didn't rinse the rice. And I just put the water on. I didn't even measure it. I oh eyeballed my. it. And I cooked it. And uh, a couple hours later, I hear my dad say, Joan! Oh, <laughs> I was no. like, oh, F, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. what? You know, so I, like, go downstairs, and I always knew that when I could see the whites of my father's eyes, like, this is a very serious situation. His eyes were so wide, and he's holding the rice in the rice bucket, and he's got the rice bag. <laughs> 
one hand. And he's like, what did you do to this rice? <laughs> I, like, I can count on my hand how often I've seen him this angry. He threw the rice paddle oh in the sink. Gosh. He threw the bucket in. The, he's like, I can't eat this rice. It's too dry. And he was so mad. And after that, I became not traumatized because I don't want to like diminish people who've actually been traumatized, but I have that memory so like etched into my brain. And every time I make rice to this day, I think of the whites of my father's eyes while I'm rinsing like That's obsessively. so traumatized. I'm sure you cook rice so much. <laughs> and to have that in the back of your mind as you're making rice. All the time. But it's like a funny incident. We, um, I think my brother's friends were around and they heard him. <laughs> Losing his mind over the oh rice, my gosh. and they called it the rice rage. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a couple of my father has a couple of rage incidents, but it's so funny to hear you say like there was a sort of scary punishment, like penalization, yeah, aspect. Yeah. When you think about your memories with your parents, do you often find that it is memories of them making food, serving food, or you know, going out to dinner, like food memories that you find more pleasant? Yeah, for sure. Because I think I, I I don't know why I always remember getting yelled at the most. <laughs> so I like to revert back to the memories of food um, that they cooked. It was also those times when they were like happiest, I would feel like. The boy thing is so relatable because I have a younger brother. And after each meal, we had to get a glass of water for our parents. And it was always me. Clean up the table, it was always me because mm -hmm. I was a girl. And... Like, when I was younger, I couldn't say anything, but as I got into, like, high school and stuff, I would, like, death stare at my younger brother and just, like, help, too. And then my parents kind of understood it, but I am so dumb. Like, the boy doesn't have to do anything because he is a boy. It's just... It is ingrained in their way of thinking. My mother is obviously less like that. She is so Americanized in many ways, and she was the breadwinner of our family when I was growing up. So there was this sort of implied matriarchy in my family but it was very much the same where Jason didn't really have to do much in the kitchen if at all and the biggest fight that my father and I ever had in the history of fights was when I refused to make him food because my father was like you need to make him instant ramen noodles and I was like nope I'm not doing it he's what I think he was probably at that time 10 years old I was like, he can make it himself. I know he can. I've seen him do it. And my dad's like, that. no, you're the girl, and you're his older sister, and you have to do it. And I just found that so unbearably sexist and dismissive. Mm -hmm. And so um, I refused to do it, and he kicked me out of the house. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It How was for you. I was 13. He kicked me out of the house. And but of course they thought like I would just sit on the front stoop. Did you like, you just ran off? I like, left. Right? <laughs> I left and I they lost their minds. <laughs> You're like, you kicked me out. I'm like, what do you think? I'm stupid? I just <laughs> sit around here in the middle of the night? Like, no. So I ran over to my best friend's house. Silly them, they never thought to check. Um, and they spent about six or seven hours like losing their minds. They finally called my youth minister at church and he knew to call my best friend and they picked me up. And I remember as soon as I was returned home, uh, I walked through the door and my father collected me in the biggest bear hug I've ever received from him in my life. And he started sobbing. <laughs> So it all ended okay. Yeah, and he learned his lesson <laughs> not to kick someone out for not making yeah, ramen. Not instant yeah. ramen. Isn't that so funny how like instant ramen like constantly, at least in my life, it's it's been sort of this interesting refrain and like sort of a, the backdrop to a lot of family moments. I've always said that food is such an excellent vehicle for diplomacy. A couple months ago, I was invited to the White House to meet with the chef and the first lady in preparation for the state dinner with the president and the first lady of South Korea. It was only the second state dinner of its kind hosted by the present administration and thus symbolized the country's mutual esteem and respect, laying the groundwork for a future built on that goodwill. You see, there's something about serving food that inevitably disarms people, however angry or defensive they might be. It's a lesson that I learned from watching my grandmothers and mother, and it's one that Lisa learned early on as well. But as you'll hear, Lisa also discovers, literally as we are talking, 
that perhaps she was using food not just as a tool for bringing people together, but to heal some of the wounds that you sustain when you're a child inside a not always peaceful home. What would you say is, you know, it sounds like you ate a lot of instant ramen during um, previous to the pandemic and perhaps during the pandemic, but even just growing up in high school, what was that one food that you learned to make for yourself? <laughs> I didn't really learn. <laughs> You're like, cup of noodles? <laughs> uh, it really is. Like, um, I, at the start of the pandemic, I really did not know cooking. And I did not know how to fry an egg or boil an egg. It really, the, the funny thing is, like, as I talk to you, I do remember there was one dish that I did help my parents with. And I knew to make this any time my parents got into an argument. Yeah, so, like, I knew, like, I had to. It was just a simple chopping down a whole chicken, which I think I didn't do it correctly, but just chopping down into pieces. And I was probably, like, 13 or 14. And then mixing it with, like, fish sauce and a bunch of different things. I can't even remember what all the ingredients were, but I remember reverting to that and, like, cooking it for them. But then now I don't even know what's in it. But as an adult, I think I tried to cook, but I ate out a lot, mm -hmm. like through college um, and afterwards when I was living on my own. Um, it was a lot of that and just eating whatever my roommates had. Where did you learn how to make instant ramen then? It just had to have been the back of the <laughs> instant yeah. ramen case. <laughs> maybe I just can't remember because I just like am hiding that memory because maybe it was a dark time or something. I don't know. Uh, I like I'm trying. My dad used to make the uh, Kung Fu noodles. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know, they're the, the orange packet. But he used to make those, um, I think, maybe just prior to the pandemic a little bit, I was making instant ramen. Mm -hmm. I love what you said about this was the dish. And what was the name of that dish that you mentioned that you made for your parents when they were arguing? It was just a stir-fry chicken. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was like a, a stir-fry, like a basic stir-fry. That's a good one to sort of yeah. learn from, I think. But why do you think that you felt that making food for your parents could potentially help when they were arguing? I think it was one less thing for them to do and also for me to keep busy so you don't like hear the arguing, you know? It's not like my parents fought all the time, but when they did, I always felt like I had to fix it somehow. And this is so weird that I'm talking about this. I'm the, I tried to fix it with cooking, and then now cooking is so integral to what I do for a living, and it's just so interesting. But I felt like I had to keep busy um, so I didn't have to figure out what was happening, um, and also maybe it keeps me out of the line of fire mm -hmm. because I made chicken and rice, you know? Uh, but yeah, I think those are the, the main reasons. And how old were you when you started doing this? I think it was 13, 14. Yeah, yeah. around that. Yeah. And it's funny how maybe I stopped making it because I didn't want to think about it in a way because I just am now having this memory as I'm talking to you. Well, it is a responsibility too. Mm -hmm. Like when you do that, you're sort of implicitly saying, well, it's my job to a certain degree to keep the peace in my very small way, right? Yeah, keeping the peace. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Now, how many siblings have you had? You had an older brother, a younger brother, and do you have a sister as well? I have an older sister, yeah. So I'm kind of in the middle-ish. My older brother is out in Kansas City. He's got his family. My sister is out here in Orange County uh, with her family. And then my younger brother is in Kansas City with his girlfriend. Yeah. Were you close with your siblings when growing up? Not really. Uh, not as close as we are now. It's funny how as we became older, we got closer. Uh as we grew up, it was, we didn't hate each other. We also, we were very like, when you, when I would hear my friends talk about how they got into arguments with their siblings and they would like fight and argue, I never had that experience with my siblings. We just, but we weren't close. Mm. But now we're all really close. How did that happen? Mm, I think as we all moved apart, we realized how important it was. Also with my brothers and my sister, like, having little nieces and nephews for me. Like, it, it's a great bonding time, you know? And you realize time is precious. And I would do anything for my nieces and nephews. I, like, love them so much. And I remember when my sister had uh, Claire. She's my oldest niece. I just remember thinking, I, didn't, I don't think I knew what love was. 
until like Claire was born and I got to grow closer to her and I was like wow I guess love is like being willing to do anything for that person like to die for that person mm-hmm. really mm-hmm. um and then now as I experience that with her I'm experiencing with my siblings so that's really beautiful that's isn't it amazing how children have this ability to teach us things that we simply couldn't learn as children ourselves yeah for sure and just being able to see them grow but they grow so fast like ridiculous yeah (laughs) and they uh I enjoy or they're enjoying cooking with me and doing different things and kind of seeing my world and Claire loves to be in my videos (laughs) Anytime I come and she's like, let's cook this, let's cook this. And I'm like, okay, let's do it. Oh, she's following in auntie's footsteps. Yeah. She, like. I was like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And she says, I want to be a YouTuber. I was like, oh, God. <laughs> like, oh, boy. Imagine walking into a cocktail party and someone asks you, what do you do? Oftentimes, we've got a stock answer. For me, it used to be very easy to answer that question. Lawyer. But what if you no longer identified with your day job and instead – had to answer that question with your passion. Not the thing you have to do, but the thing you love to do. It isn't always easy to explain that, right? Lisa and I talk about how we introduce ourselves when we get asked that very common question and how we navigate people's preconceived notions about what it means to be a content creator. So do you agree with Claire that that's what you are, a YouTuber? I guess so. I think the majority of people, when they see me, they say they recognize me from YouTube. Mm -hmm. I get the occasional TikToker or you're that foodie girl or you're that ramen girl. (laughs) Yeah, so I'll take it. Mm -hmm. Do you call yourself a YouTuber? Oh, sometimes. It depends on who I'm talking to. But as a general rule, and this took me a long time, I'd be curious to hear your story. But, you know, for a while after I left the firm, or I, I should say after I withdrew from partnership, I struggled a lot when people ask me, so what do you do? And that, I mean, you can ask my husband. It was like the most hilarious bit of comedy ever because you'd see me stuttering and go awkward and then be like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> you know? And, and then finally, you know, we hammered out a script answer to that. And now I feel very comfortable saying I'm a writer uh, who also creates content and also lawyers sometimes, but largely I'm a writer. But, you know, if I'm with a bunch of people from Google (laughs) or if I'm with other content creators, I'll say I'm a YouTuber just because I think they understand that. So it depends. But what do you say when people ask you they don't know and possibly who you are already? I I say I I keep it very simple. I just say I make food videos. And then they either ask more or they're just like they're just nodding their head. And yeah, most of them are like, what what do you mean? And then I say, I just make cooking videos. I travel, make food videos, things like that. Yeah, I think more and more people are becoming um, more acclimated to understanding that there is this economy out there that allows for the normalization of our type of work, which Mm -hmm. is content creation. So when people now hear content creator, more and more I'm saying, oh, okay, you know, they know what that is instead of being like, what does that mean? <laughs> like, what content do you create? <laughs> yeah. I find also people are very, um, is adverse the right word, to the word influencer. Um, so I don't really see that word used that often anymore. It's mainly like content creator. Do you, do you feel that way too? I do. I think it depends on the generation. I think like, you know, my generation and older, I think they are still using the word influencer. But I think that one of the things that, you know, I, I believe TikTok did was to use that word creator. That was at least the first place I saw it. Uh, I saw it when I first started TikTok. And I was like, wow, people call themselves creator? God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I really never thought of it that yeah, way. Yeah, I was like, who do they think they are? <laughs> God or something (laughs) and because I was so unfamiliar with the platform at the time and then I realized oh no no that's what they call the person who made the original video because I was looking at the comments and I'd be like these people (laughs) (laughs) everyone's a creator yeah Yeah. and then I realized oh well that's kind of nice because it's true they're creatives and they've created something and I was very pleased with how that caught on and I think it was because oh well if they're the creator 
well, then now we have to find a word for what they're creating, and they're creating content. So content creator became the thing. And I do appreciate that much more than influencer because I think influencer does have this connotation that we're trying to just sell you things um, as opposed to perhaps influencing some of the more touchy-feely aspects of identity, like your thoughts, your hearts, your uh, compulsions, like what are the things that drive you? And, you know, I always say, well, I'm trying to influence you. I'm trying to influence you to think about things a little bit more. I'm trying to influence you to be more compassionate. I'm trying to influence you to love yourself more and to love your family more. And I'm trying to influence you to cook better. You know, like I'm doing all those things. Um, so in some ways, I still consider myself an influencer. But you're right. People do have this unpleasant reaction to that term. What do you think you're trying to influence, if at all? I think my biggest influence is um, showing people that cooking isn't as intimidating as they may think it is because that's how I started my cooking journey. So intimidated. I didn't want to cook anything because I was too scared to mess anything up. And this was during the pandemic? Yeah. So I want to – and even in the beginning, though, I, w I did not have that probably goal. That my goal is just to get through a dish without burning down the house, right? <laughs> and then good goal. <laughs> yeah, that's a good goal. Stay alive. Um, but now my goal is to see that because um, I do get people saying like, "I started cooking because of you," and to me that is, I just mind blowing because I never thought, as me as a learning cook, that that could be a thing, you know. So. I really want to lean into that and um, try more dishes too because, I mean, even if a dish fails, um, you learn something from it and the next time you try it, you're going to do better. Or you may be like, I'm not even going to try it. I'll just try something else next time. What do you think helped you to muscle through that intimidation? Because I think there are a lot of people who maybe think about cooking but are as intimidated as you were and don't really have the tools to say, well, I am intimidated, but I'm going to do it anyway. What was it for you that made you pursue it, even though it was maybe uncomfortable in the beginning? I think a lot of it was actually the community, like reading through the comments and people saying that thanks for like showing um, where you messed up in it. And then just seeing that it was just really good feedback from everyone um, and then it was encouraging words too, like in the comments, people like, you get, you'll get it next time. Like you did a good job and they gave me suggestions on how I could fix it. Um, so a lot of it was the community telling me to push forward, mm -hmm. which I really appreciate. Did it seem almost like the community helped you to feel like, actually it's okay if I make mistakes and totally like fall on my face and... I will figure it out or I won't like it it's fine I'm I'm still good yeah and I think uh that was part of it and also when you get the negative comments it it like feels you more today like oh you suck at cooking you shouldn't even try I'm like well I, I'll try next time just because you told me not to right <laughs> just out of spite um just continue doing it uh those are a lot those are I mean they're not fun comments to get but they're fun to like reply to with the video some are constructive criticism, like they have, it's, it's good feedback. So just to understand a little bit more kind of what's going on contextually, at this time, Telehue Food is a little bit on hold because the pandemic has basically shut down all restaurant businesses, right? Yeah. Well, I just re, we just rebranded a couple of months ago and then we both got really busy, but it's still a project that Kyle and I are working on. We're still going to family-owned restaurants and filming them and highlighting them on those channels as well as our own personal channels. So I guess w when you started your own personal channel, was that a totally separate project from Telehue Food? Yes. I think when my thought process when I separated the two was just like one was restaurants and one was my personal journey of learning how to cook. But now my personal channel is about me traveling, anything food related. So when I go to restaurants too, look, I'll film. Um, when I travel, uh, I film on my personal as well. But really the highlight of Chew On It is to just highlight the family owned mm -hmm. restaurants. What made you think about starting a completely new project that, I mean, 
I think there are a lot of people who in your shoes would have said, well, I guess my YouTube channel is on hold or I'll continue working on that channel but with a totally different theme. You decided, well, I'm going to put that one on hold with the idea that we'll get back to it when restaurants reopen. But in the meantime, I'm going to start a whole new channel with a whole new concept and we'll see where that goes. I don't know my thought process at that moment. So much... I, I, you as a content creator know it. Ch the algorithm changes so many times. I think I've just been whatever has been working. I just doubled down on it, and I think uh, people were enjoying these videos. So I was like, okay, I'm just gonna double down. Uh, I'll sprinkle in the instant ramen videos. I'll do spring roll videos. I'll build my spice tolerance. Anything that I enjoyed creating and I knew people enjoyed, just double down. You know, even in, as a I guess a business owner now is just like, this is what you have to do to grow. I think one of the real success stories of your channel is the leveraging of cereal content. And by that, I don't mean cereal in a bowl. <laughs> <laughs> I love cereal. Yeah, that's good too. Um, but what I mean is you have your, you know, building your spice tolerance series. You have your um, ramen series. You also have cooking for my neighbor series. What was it that got you into this mode of, okay, I'm going to not just do one-off videos every single day. I'm going to create cereal content that maybe brings people in, you know, gives them a stake in how this story unfolds. I think it all really started with my Building Your Spice Tolerance series. Um, how that all started was there's a Thai restaurant in Kansas City, Thai Orchid. My friends own it, and they were trying to, like, figure out TikTok at that time. And so they were – I was helping consult with them and figure it out. I was like, you know, you should try – you could do series. No, I actually didn't say series. Sorry. I said people are doing spice series and stuff uh, or spice challenges. And one day he texted me, uh, John, and he said, um, okay, I've got a great idea. Will you be the first one to do it? And I was like, um. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay. And he said, all you have to do is take four ounces of dried Thai chili flakes and pour it over instant noodles and eat it for the challenge. And I was like, okay, I can do that. And I show up to his restaurant to pick it up. And this thing, four ounces is, is a lot of dried Thai chili flakes. And as I'm driving home, I'm just looking at it. And I'm like, there's no way. <laughs> there's just no way I'm going to be able to do this. As I'm driving home, this plan is formulating in my head. And I don't know if it was influenced by like other videos I was watching or what. But I decided at that point that I would do a five day, four day series where I would try to build my spice tolerance. And so then I Googled like spice challenges and for four days straight, I did it. And then on the fifth day, I think fifth or sixth day, day I did the spice challenge and with I was doing John, it, with John, uh, with myself. Oh, well, I just had to shoot it myself. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. He mm -hmm. didn't, he didn't. Oh, so he, was like, he wasn't at yeah, his restaurant. Yeah. Like where no, he <laughs> I just did it at home. And since I was doing it in real time, like each day I would film and then I would edit it and post it that night. So people were so invested and then when I did it, I failed. <laughs> I failed the challenge. It was so spicy. Uh, I still remember that. I, <laughs> I started off with half a gallon of milk and half a tub of ice, the half gallon tub of vanilla ice cream. And at the end of the video, I'm like crying. Half the ice cream's gone. Half the milk is gone. Oh I'm my. just like gulping it. It oh was God. so bad. And so then throughout that year and the following year, I did sporadic spice challenges. And then last June, I was able to take on the challenge again and finish it. Succeeded? Succeeded. Yeah, I conquered the challenge. And I think I've taken that, that formatting to the other stuff. So feeding my neighbors took off really quickly. It, every series that I started wasn't meant to be a series. It was just meant to be a one video. But when a, when a video really takes off, and I can tell the audience really likes it, then I continue with it. Like Double this, down. Yeah, like raiding people's ramen stash. I did not intend for that to be a series, but then people are enjoying it, so I was like, okay, I'll just raid all my friends' ramen stashes. That's yeah. amazing. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about cooking for your neighbor. Can you tell us, like, what inspired that initial video? Yeah. Uh, so this was back when I lived in Wichita, my roommate was working in Topeka, so she wasn't home, and I was learning to cook, and I was, like, just pumping out videos, 
So every single day I was cooking something different. And you don't really cook for one person. When you're cooking a new dish each day, it's always, I don't know, for two to three people at least. And so then um, I had met my neighbors just like talking acquaintance-wise. But then we had each other's numbers. So I was just like, I have a lot of extra food. Would you guys like some? And then that's just kind of like anytime I cooked something, I would just bring it over there. And they enjoyed it. And they were, they uh, gave me good feedback too. Like if something wasn't good. <laughs> How was that? They weren't rude. They were just like, it could be better, but they would give me suggestions. It wouldn't just be like, this is horrible. Throw it away. <laughs> yeah. So then we've become friends and I'm like seeing them when I go back to Wichita this weekend. Um, but then as I moved to Kansas City, I have a new neighbor and like, People also like it because they don't show his fa- or I don't know if they, but they may not like it, but I don't show his face uh, and I just hand it to him. So they, it was like a mystery. Yeah. They're it. like trying to figure it out, but we swap quite a bit because he cooks and then I also cook. So we swap a lot and that's, that's a fun element to it. So were you like friends at all with the first neighbor before you started offering them your food? I wouldn't say friends. We just like wave at each other when we like park our cars or something that this, takes like enormous guts like I would never be yeah, able to do that yeah. uh it was with it was like that with them for my neighbor in Kansas City we were friends and he's like hey I'm moving in across the street I was like cool well, there you go you will neighbors. be in my video yeah. <laughs> you will be the neighbor exactly you'll be my new neighbor mm-hmm. um so I don't know if like if I move again if I'll have a new neighbor but it's also it's also different because it is content creation like I don't want people to be in a video or their food in a video if they don't want it to be of course so there's always that element to like even with my nieces and nephews I know that they may not like when they grow up they may not want their faces in the video so that's why I try my best to just keep their voices and mm-hmm. stuff so yeah what do you think it was about those cooking for my neighbor videos that resonated so much with your community and you said they took off pretty quickly they did um <laughs> there's so it's a lot of like because there's a lot of elements to it. One, the food didn't always look the best. So people are like, what are you feeding your neighbor? <laughs> <laughs> so there's that. Two, I think it's a little bit of re- the relatability aspect because I think a lot of people swap food with their neighbors or like just bring them cookies or something. So there's that. And the third is um, <laughs> I got a lot of comments about my neighbor looking really good. <laughs> like he's hot is what they all said. <laughs> And, like, we're, we're just friends, uh, but that was another. There's just so many elements that that allowed for engagement on those videos, and I think that's why those are some of the reasons why it took off. It could have been other stuff. Um, and people are just curious, like, what am I feeding them, and then what are they feeding me? Now, did you start making these um, What I'm Making for My Neighbor videos during the pandemic? Yes, I did. One of the first video, I had my mask on, and people went nuts. They're like, why are you wearing your mask to give food to your neighbor? I'm like, because... I'm being neighborly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so it was during that, because I remember um, wearing my mask on. But, yeah, it was during that time, because that's when I was starting to learn how to cook, and so I was cooking a lot. I think that makes a lot of sense. I think when we were all enforcing our self-isolation, the idea of stepping outside of our door and handing a, a, you know, a Tupperware food to a neighbor, that's probably like the most exciting action we see. <laughs> it could have been, yeah, yeah for you sure. Know? Like, because we were not leaving our houses even to go to work. So mm-hmm. to step out with your mask on and say, hey, I made some food, are you into eating it? Like that's, that's the most intense level of social interaction we were probably getting at that time. As I mentioned at the outset, Lisa's story is not ordinary. She was among the first to find the kind of viral success that many YouTubers have to build over a decade. She did it in a month. Sure, timing was important. YouTube was just launching its competitor product to TikTok, Shorts, and was therefore looking for new talent. Lisa happened to fall right into that pool. But as you'll hear, it wasn't all luck. I met you through, um, what was that, the Clubhouse app. Oh, yeah. yeah. Clubhouse. Um, good old Clubhouse. Good old Clubhouse. Don't know if anyone still does that, but that is where I met you. And you were sharing sort of your story of how you catapulted from being, you know, a moderately successful content creator to like a superstar <laughs> content creator overnight. 
And I remember hearing from you a few times and from other content creators who were talking about you as like the Lisa template, which is, you know, post three times a day, (laughs) every single day for six weeks, and then all of a sudden all of your videos will go viral. And I can certainly attest to that. Like I posted every single day. I did not do three times a day, but I did post nearly every single day for 30 days or something like that. And all of a sudden I saw my videos start to go viral and pop off. But I guess my question for you is, you know, not please tell us your super dark secrets of how you become a superstar. I'm sure there are other people who want to hear that, but that's not really what this podcast is about. I think it's more just this idea of what was it inside of you that had you so determined to like make this the thing? Because Posting three videos a day, every single day, for an extended period of time is immensely grueling. So what was driving you to go through that process? I think first and foremost, I had no choice. Um, I had quit my job, like at that point, it was a year prior, and restaurants were shut down. I was like, if this doesn't work, then I have to go back to, you know, my nine to five. Which is the paralegal job? Yeah. Um, and so I, or like something else, I could have switched to something else, I guess. Um, so I had to make it work and, um, really, to be honest, I had no life. <laughs> that's, why, that's why I was able to post three times a day for that. Did like, you time. enjoy it? Uh, I did enjoy it. Like I really enjoyed the feedback from the community and like when you're creating content in any type of medium or aspect you want to the main goal is to provide value and I think I was providing escapism I was providing entertainment and education in a way where it's like don't do that when you cook you know (laughs) learn from my mistakes exactly so I think by it was fulfilling because I was providing value and I felt useful and so it helped me do that like I said I had no life I was single (laughs) it's just me and my cat (laughs) <laughs> and so like and your it, neighbor <laughs> in my in my neighbor so it was like easy to pump out those videos and obviously the algorithm's always changing so like if you do that now I don't know if that would work but at that time it did and that's why you know is doubling down a word because I say it doubling I say it that way doubling down. not double okay. downing like that would okay say that. <laughs> yeah. doubling down like uh-huh. that's just why any anytime anything worked I just just double down on it at what point do you think you realized okay um, this is now my job, this is now my career, this is now my future, as opposed to that lurking fear that someday I may have to go back to a law firm or be a paralegal or some other nine-to-fiver. It was definitely when YouTube, like, I made, you, I, YouTube has been amazing. Like, I owe <laughs> it a lot to YouTube, but once I made enough on YouTube to pay off my student loan debt and my credit card debt and I felt I was like wow this this is my (laughs) this is it this is how I'm going to make my living I think at that point is when I realized that this this is it for my career what was that feeling like when you were able to pay off your debt with the, the earnings that probably many people would never have guessed could be possible it felt great I think like with anyone with debt that's always a looming thing in the background you know, you can't really, you're not completely free to do your own thing until that's all gone. And I felt like a big weight lifted off my shoulders. I think that underscores sort of the temerity, if you will, of your decision to quit your nine to five. I mean, for me, I was like, all my debts are paid off. (laughs) You know, I had like a whole bunch left in savings. I had a retirement plan and everything. And I was like, I'm not doing anything crazy (laughs) until I do that. So walk us through that decision-making process. You said that it was about a year before your video was really taking off. And you decide, notwithstanding sort of a lot of uncertainty in your future, of course, at the time, you had no idea that there would be a pandemic coming around but still a fair amount of uncertainty that you're going to give up the steady paycheck. Again, what was it that really drove that decision? Part of it was laziness probably. (laughs) (laughs) Says the girl who made three videos a day every day for her. (laughs) It's like, do I want to get up at 7? I actually 
tried to my best to get ready within five minutes each morning before getting to work. Efficient, not yeah, lazy. Yeah, <laughs> so just like not wanting to do that anymore. And again, the support from my siblings to just do it. Um, and at that point, it was probably two years before my videos really took off because it was January 2019. But I also, the re- some of the restaurants were reaching out to me and saying like they were so thankful that I came and I was able to film and feature their restaurants and they got a lot of business out of it. And again, it's that fulfillment. It's like that that's my purpose. And how can I not go all in on that? Because some days I would go work my full-time job, film, and then edit late into the night, two, three in the morning, and then the next day re- do the same thing. And it was it was tiring. <laughs> like, it was a lot of work. Um, and I think at that point, you just, you just hit a breaking point. Um, and it wasn't very responsible to do, to quit when um, you do have debt and things like that. My parents found out through Facebook. Oh, my God. Because yeah, <laughs> I didn't want to tell my parents, like, I am a big people pleaser. Um, less so now, but I tried to please my parents as much as I could growing up. So I didn't want to tell them. And they found out because, uh, when you switch your career on Facebook, it like has a whole back. I don't know if it still does it, but it's like a celebration post or something. It'll be like Lisa updated her career or work or something. And I don't know what I, I think I just updated it to like something new. And then my mom was like, (gasps) Like, what? She's, like, calling me, calling my brothers. What happened? Like, where's Lisa? And she was freaking out, but it was already done, so. And you weren't willing to turn back? No, I wasn't. I was just going to go full force into this project that I had. You said that you reached a breaking point. Do you, can you literally pinpoint that breaking point? Do you remember what it was that sort of tipped you over the edge and said, I'm I'm done with this paralegaling. I'm going to go full time with creating content for these restaurants yeah I think it was when I I don't know if it yeah it was when I was traveling I was traveling quite a bit to Kansas City and also I was in Lincoln um visiting Nebraska yeah I like Lincoln yeah Lincoln's great (laughs) visiting my brother and this was probably our fourth or fifth or maybe more conversation about this and I really like had a heart to heart to him with him and I was just like I just can't do this anymore like, obviously, this is a stable job. It pays the bills. But, like, my passion lies elsewhere. Like, helping others accomplish their goals and food, too. Like, food, like how can you turn down, like, food and things, food videos and stuff like that? So, yeah, I think that was it. Like, he gave me the encouragement to quit my job. Although it took me a while to tell my boss. <laughs> Your boss? Yeah, it took me a while to, like, uh, give my notice because I was so scared. Uh, but eventually happened and here we are thank god it happened yeah I love that you were able to have that heart to heart with your brother because it sounds like that may not have been a conversation that would have been comfortable for you when you were growing up what do you think that led you to be able to be that vulnerable with your brother I think as we grew up we just got closer and I just felt more comfortable with telling him things um even now like they're great like, all my siblings are great to talk to, to bounce ideas off of. And I'm really glad that we have been able to become closer as we've grown up because, like, I don't know what I would do without them. Yeah. 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 One of the things that you said was that you told your brother, this is my passion. My passion is helping people and um, serving community and things like that. I've always found that, for me, it's sometimes a struggle to identify what my passion is. Like, I don't know what I'm passionate about. I have no idea what I'm passionate about. And uh, it took a lot of soul searching for me to, okay, pinpoint, like, this is the thing that really sparks me up. And it wasn't until I was in my 40s that I really figured that out. And I know there are a lot of people listening who similarly are so caught up with the day-to-day. You know, they wake up, just like you were saying, try and get ready in five minutes, <laughs> get that commute in, get to the office, do what they need to do, get home. Often they have children or they have people they need to take care of. And there's no time to actually even think about what their passions are. What do you think it was for you that helped you to really hone in on, ah, this is my passion. This is what I was meant to do. Part of it was that it didn't feel like work to me. 
when I would go to these restaurants and film, it was always fun because I got to talk to these owners of these chefs. And it was also hearing about their passion. Their passion was to grow their restaurant and how they were going to accomplish that. So everyone I met was like entrepreneur. And they gave me so much insight into that type of world. Obviously, I didn't go into the restaurant world, but learning from them um, just made things a lot easier. Uh, and yeah, that was a big part of it. I think restaurateurs as entrepreneurs are a very distinct class of entrepreneur because I think it takes this like insane level of gutsiness and toughness um, to survive things like global pandemics and to really be subject to the mercy of like so many waves and, you know, economic fluctuations. I feel like they are oftentimes the most severely hit by some of these things. So their stories must have, like you said, been incredibly inspiring. Do you ever aspire to open your own restaurant one day? I think after seeing like how they're such hard workers and after seeing how much work they have to put in it. And if you open a restaurant, you're going to have to be there every single day for a long time. And as much as I can respect that and appreciate that, I don't think I could do it. But I'm not going to say no to it completely because who knows? Uh, maybe I'll open an Insta ramen shop. Oh, my God. <laughs> not amazing. legit ramen, but Insta ramen. <laughs> like, why not, right? I think Insta ramen is legit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that would be great. I also wanted to talk about that Panasonic camera that mm -hmm. you had at the very beginning, I think in like 2016-ish. Mm -hmm. Is that around when you started filming the restaurant content? Yeah, and quick story behind how I got that. I got that camera because I got drunk with my friend at the time, and we were like, oh, you know what we should do? We should do reviews. We should get drunk and do reviews. And so I bought the camera for that. And we actually did five or six videos, which are now like not on the internet anymore. <laughs> Scrubbed clean. You're not going to find them. Uh, but really, uh, we had um, just our friends and families watching the videos. And I remember when I hit like 100 followers, I remember going, oh, I texted all my friends. I was like, thank you so much for your support. I appreciate it so much. And that was at 100. And uh, yeah, looking back at that, it was pretty interesting. But yeah, that's why I got the camera. Did you know anything about videography at then? Mm -mm. Okay. No. That's why I like... I didn't call myself a videographer for the longest time because I felt like I was disrespecting actual yeah, videographers <laughs> yeah. who went to school, who yeah. did that. And so I, yeah, it took me a long time for me to even call myself a videographer. Um, but yeah, even now I'm still learning the camera. This whole month I've been using my Sony camera and just learning the ins and outs of it. Did you use the Panasonic when you started your personal channel? I actually used my phone. My phone is still used for about 85% of my videos um, because it's, phones these days are amazing. The cameras are all auto, auto focus, auto white balance and everything, so it just makes it easier. And if I'm shooting three videos a day or posting that many, then you just want to find the, the way with less friction, least amount of friction. Yeah, the path of least resistance. Yeah. Super important. People often think that I'm a perfectionist, and I can understand why. I do have some pretty high standards when it comes to a lot of things. However, what many people may not realize is that my very first viral food video was definitely the opposite of perfect. It was made using an outdated iPhone just propped up against my kitchen wall, terrible, like super ugly lighting, and no voiceover. Although I enjoy creating beautiful things, I also know that perfectionism can be the number one thing that prevents you from doing anything. And anything is a lot better than nothing. What I think is so interesting is that apparently YouTube is full of very professional, polished, beautiful content. And yet you're like, I'm just gonna use my phone and I'm gonna just put it up there. Did you ever worry at any point like, oh, my content isn't good enough or not polished enough or it could be better, it's not perfect enough? Yeah, there's always that uh, a bit of like imposter syndrome. And then when you're seeing all, and then also when you're growing a bit more, you meet other creators who are doing you what you feel like is like bigger and better things. 
And you realize at some point you realize it's not that they're just on their own journey doing their own thing that works for them. And so everyone had this camera and I'm like, oh my gosh, I need this care, like a nice camera. Um, so then I bought the Sony January of last year and I shot some videos with it, but I actually got some kickback from it from my community and people were saying that it's too polished, it's too high quality and that they had to stop watching me. And then I got spooked and I stopped using the camera for a while. But then as I learned how to use the camera, I really enjoyed it and looked, I lo like liked how the footage looked. So um, now I'm using it more and I don't really care about those. Now it's like people are like, oh, we love to see the glow up. It's just so interesting over time, like how people are. Um, but I like to do a nice mix between phone and camera footage um, because phone is so easy. I think what you said about, you know, doing the thing that has the least amount of friction is that we sometimes don't realize that we're our own worst friction. <laughs> like these weird ideas that we may have about what it takes to post something on the internet, to be a YouTuber. We create unnecessary hurdles for ourselves. I often hear from people, oh yeah, no, I wanna do it, but I'm still not good enough with a camera. I'm like, you don't need to be good with a camera. Or I wanna do this, but I don't know how to cook anything. Well, Elisa is proof that you don't even need to know how to fry an egg <laughs> before you start posting. Like, there are so many barriers that we erect for ourselves, like, this is a great segue into uh, the show that we can't stop talking about, which is in succession. Uh, and by the time this airs, most people will have watched it, but if not, spoilers ahead. Uh, in the most recent episode, which is the penultimate episode nine, we hear from Kendall in his eulogy of his father where he says, my father knew how to act. He built, he acted when so many other people found reasons not to. And oftentimes those reasons are actually not really good reasons to not act. Did you feel at all any sort of barriers that you had erected in your head sort of dissipating as you continued down your journey? Yeah, I would say so in the beginning I was so scared to even let my friends and family know I was posting on YouTube or like TikTok or Instagram because I didn't want them seeing the videos and judging me I think the judgment comes in um pretty hard on myself because I know like if they see it they're not going to judge me so I think it was me projecting or like me possibly thinking I don't know overthinking things but you know after a while it's just like screw it like my high school friends that I never see, like if they see a YouTube video or something, it, it just is what it is, you know? Um, that was, those, I guess, fears dissipated pretty quickly once I found my groove. But even now I find myself, um, I wouldn't say doubting myself, but putting up barriers. Like mm -hmm. last night you are asking me, would you ever start your own podcast? And I'm like, no. And I was giving you like all these list of reasons. I'm like, Am I just making up excuses or what? Or is that just not a route for me? But just, I think once you overcome some challenges, the new ones come up and then you have to figure out a way to overcome those. So you mentioned that, like, for example, when I was like, hey, you want to start a podcast? You were like, no, 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 these are all the reasons. But then you started wondering whether these, just, these are just excuses. How do you tell the difference between these are just excuses that I'm sort of making up as opposed to, no, these are legitimate things that I should think about. I think I think about the conversation and maybe I'm an overthinker as well and I just don't like me complaining. I think that's one of my pet peeves is complaining and I realized that was kind of how I was sounding in a way. Um, but I really think you don't, really know if it's a viable option to do unless you dive into it. So unless I actually start a podcast, then I don't know what the challenges will really be mm. and if I could do it. How do you find out what are the things to try? Because that's another thing that I think many people struggle with, particularly if they're an entrepreneur or you know they work for themselves is, well, the options are endless. I could go down this way. I could do this. I could start a podcast. I could write a book. I could do a product line. I could do online courses. I could do, like, there's 70 things that I could try. How do you sit down and say, okay, 
these are the five things I'm going to try. I would say it's like a 50-50 mix of 50 of it is diving straight in and just doing it and not thinking about it. But the other part is um, really taking the time to think the concept through. And I've been trying to do that with my long form ideas. And also I realized as you think more on a concept or an idea, it gets better. Um, I have a series where I'm rating my hotel breakfast and that wasn't supposed to happen. Like it wasn't planned or anything. I had a whole road trip planned. And I think it was about a week before when I was thinking, oh, I could have hotel breakfast at each of the places and I would just kind of show what I have. But then as I got further and further into it, I thought maybe I can make it even better by rating it to keep audience retention. And then as it's in the back of your mind, as you're going on a walk or as you're going for groceries, you have more ideas. I don't know if you have like a note app or something. Where, yeah, you just pop it into it. So like that was thought out. And then some of the things I just like dive into and just see if it works, if it doesn't work. Longtime listeners of the podcast or followers of the newsletter will know that I love TV. Other than running or curling up with a good book, TV is one of the few things I find can really help diffuse stress and anxiety. As I've hinted at throughout our chat, one of the things I was delighted to discover about Lisa was that she too is an avid TV connoisseur. And I use that word intentionally. We both like not just any old TV show, we like good TV. I was just so excited to get into what Lisa has lined up on her streaming devices these days. Also, at the time of this recording, we were on the cusp of the succession finale, which aired on May 28th, 2023. Lisa and I both make our predictions, so there will be spoilers ahead. For those of you who enjoyed and finished the show, you can grade how we did. We mentioned earlier that you're a big television fan like rattle off your five top five television shows right now <laughs> uh succession perry mason um i'm watching barry right now uh westworld and um what's another one i like stranger things mm, stranger things is a good yeah one. yeah yeah so many of those are also my favorite shows which i think is really interesting because I think the fact that we have such similar <laughs> tastes <laughs> in TV like instantly makes me say yeah I think I could really be good friends with her <laughs> yeah I mean if we could watch shows together all the time and last night was really funny we were watching episode nine together and, and it was fun getting to have someone to talk to yeah like we, would you see like, that gasp, like <laughs> I, because usually I just watch it at home and I look at my cat and he's just like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't know what you're thinking, Lisa. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So why don't you give your top three predictions for the <gasps> season finale of Succession? Okay. And then by the time this airs, it will have, you know, the season finale <laughs> will have already aired. And then we can grade <laughs> your predictions. I'll give mine and you give yours. Okay. This is tough. Because I feel like everything is going to implode and I think no one's going to get what they want. There's just so many stories right now. I think one, um, I think Kendall's going to lose his family. I think it's just going to be completely cut off and oh, I like think his children and his, yeah, I, I think is it Rava? Yes. Yeah. And his daughter, he's just, he says that he's going, he's doing everything for them, but it just doesn't seem like it at this point. I don't know what's going to happen, like if they're going to get, if they're going to be able to buy or they're going to get bought out at this point. And also, I don't think Mankin's going to be the president. I think the numbers in Wisconsin, I think, they're going to find out that it's actually Jimenez. I think they're going to throw that in maybe at the very end. I like that. Yeah. I think that's going to uh, be a thing. What else is happening? Shiv and Tom, are they going to be together? That's tough. Their relationship is just like up and down, up and down. Um, I think they'll end up together. And I think she might be the CEO of... Um, Waystar Gojo. Gojo, yeah. Mm -hmm. Once Gojo buys... Wait, will Gojo buy Waystar? There's, that's iffy too. Okay, I'll, I'll lock it down and say Gojo will buy Waystar. And... Um, what's the name that the, the 
the part they're trying to cut out, ATN is going to yeah. be part of the package too. I don't think they're going to be able to carve, carve it, out. it out. Yeah. Yeah. No one's going to hold on to that other than um, Gojo. I agree with you on that. Yeah. Well, I think those are actually very thoughtful <laughs> predictions. Yeah. I would say I agree with you starting from the end of what you just said, I think that Gojo will ultimately end up acquiring Waystar and ATN and that Shiv will be – actually, I'm not going to say that Shiv will be CEO. I don't think any of the siblings get what they want. Even though I think of all of them Shiv deserves the most, I don't think she's going to get it either. I think that my bet, and I, I mentioned this last night, is that Ebba is somehow <laughs> going to become that's the so, – That's such an interesting take. <laughs> Very curious to see how that works out. Because I think she needs a payoff for the pending sexual harassment litigation. And the blood, the frozen <laughs> yes, blood being exactly. sent to her. Yeah. So that's that's the payment is I will make you CEO. So I, I dub Ebba as the US CEO of the Waystar Gojo Enterprise. I think that Greg is somehow going to end up back into a mascot costume and throwing up in it. I think that will ultimately be the very poetic full circle moment that we have. And then in terms of Tom and Shiv, that is tough. I have to say of all of the relationships in that show, that is the most relatable and realistic to me because I feel like marriages are the most complicated and fraught M&As that you could possibly ever see in, in any show or any story. And I feel like there there's so much humanness like in it. I would say that I agree with you. I think they they still they are still a couple at the end of this. A very horrible, toxic <laughs> couple. Very toxic. Yeah, but they remain married nonetheless. But we'll see. I'm excited about this 90 minute yeah. episode. They did mm-hmm. with this series, they did such a great job with yeah. I mean, this is spoiler alert, obviously. The whole thing is, yeah. This whole thing has been spoiler alerted. (laughs) That whole episode three, just with Logan dying, we felt so much compassion for um, all the siblings, even Connor. (laughs) Poor guy. (laughs) Like, I often forget. forget, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, We felt so much compassion for them and empathy. And then, boom, they revert back to, like, they're conniving. Each of them, like, just, like, double down on their flaws and then you're like I don't really like you anymore um so yeah it'll be interesting to see how this plays out well you know good tv what it does is it causes you to look inwards and it makes you self-aware of that ambivalence right where you're like I want to like you but I do not like you and yet I know I shouldn't like you but I somehow still like you. I'm rooting for you for some reason. Yeah. yeah. And so that's what good television does is it makes you start to question like why do I feel empathy for like this dirtbag person or why do I want Shiv to win even though she treats her husband so horribly and she's drinking alcohol when she has a baby. Yeah. You know? um, it's just like a very interesting thing. So there's this idea that content creators or entrepreneurs, I honestly believe that that's ultimately what we are. We are owners of our own small businesses, that we're just like working around the clock, that all we're doing is videotaping and creating, editing, you know, content, writing. And don't get me wrong, sometimes I feel like my job is endless, but I make a significant amount of room for downtime. Uh, usually in the form of running in the morning. And I know you have also a pretty good fitness routine yourself, which I do want to get into, Um, but also making time for Korean dramas, watching television, vegging out in front of the TV. How important has it been to have that sort of space for yourself? Really important. I am fortunate enough that I haven't burnt out. Um, I don't know if I've ever been close but I have realized that I just can't keep going at it 100%, like full on. Um, To me, I really enjoy movies and TV shows and playing video games. And I realized without that rest and without that time to turn off my brain from thinking of ideas, um, my next travel or things like that is so important because without that, I think your ideas become stale and 
they're not as creative as they can be because you're just 100% going at it. So you don't give your time, yourself time to rest. Before we move on to that, tell us about your fitness routine because it's like fairly new development, right? It's very new, yeah. I um, I started strength training about a month and a half ago. So, but ne- then this month has I've just so much travel and so much eating, which no regrets at all. Uh, but I got this new machine. It's called the Vitruvian, and I don't like working out in front of other people. I'm such an introvert. Like I just. I just like being in my own apartment with my cat. Um, But I was working out about three to four times a week when I'm at home. And then when I'm traveling, I try to find when I have those one or two days at home, I'll work out. But really just strength training. I just want to be stronger. Um, I also want to eat more food. (laughs) And so, like, this is the perfect thing. And I can already feel it. I feel better. Um, It's crazy how it affects all part aspects of your life because now I'm thinking more about my sleep. And I'm thinking more about I need to get the right amount of rest so that my body can recover and build muscle. Because if you're working out and you're not giving yourself time to rest, like work, um, then you're not optimizing like the potential for muscle growth. I've been getting more sleep. Um, I've been drinking less as well, like drinking less alcohol, which is another positive aspect of this because I don't want to um, lessen the muscle growth or whatever. I think that what you describe is so fascinating and also motivating, right? Because I've always said that everything kind of works together. So once you start making a radical improvement in your life, like an affirmative choice, like I'm going to work out three or four times a week, then it instantly spreads out to other aspects of your life. Like you said, well, now I need to pay attention to my sleep. I also need to to pay attention to what I put into my body um, and also want to pay attention to rest. And that will, of course, impact your work as well, your productivity. And what you said earlier about how ideas grow stale, I think that's 100% true. And I have fallen victim to this myself many, many times, which is you start to just get comfortable in, oh, well, I'll just do like cooking for my husband for the rest of my life, (laughs) you know, because people really like that. I'll just stick with it because it seemed to work. Or I'll just continue doing my advice videos because people really like my advice videos. But eventually, like you said, whether the idea grows stale or simply the community has said, well, okay, we're TLDR audiences. I've had enough of that style. What's your next video? Unless you're making sure to turn that brain off, to be fully recovered, to think about new, fresh, exciting, innovative ideas, it's very easy to just fall into a rut and just continue to do routines. I do want to ask you, though, there are some people who think that content creation, influencers, we live this charmed existence and, you know, oh, and and that's not to say, like, I'm not unbelievably grateful for the job that I have and and to be able to do this for my living. And I'm sure you feel the same way. What are some of the challenges that you've encountered in the past three years as you continue to build your brand and you also continue to share your message and your story? I live a very glamorous life, so I don't know what you're talking about. It's a very charmed life. I Uh, know. (laughs) (laughs) No, I think one of the biggest challenges is me going out from be, being behind the camera and filming like these restaurants to being in front. So by being in front of a camera and getting like some videos getting millions of views, you're opening yourself up to a lot of criticism. And the biggest challenge is being able to grow that thick skin, which I didn't have before because I, like I said, I'm a big people pleaser. And so the hardest challenge for me is dealing with um, – it can be constructive criticism, but it's mainly just negative comments. And that for me has been the biggest challenge uh, besides like the work and work life balance, which I feel like I'm figuring out slowly um, and it's getting better. Dealing with negative comments and trolls is a surprisingly difficult aspect of being a YouTuber. I thought as a lawyer, I'd have thicker skin than I did. But all it takes is just one comment about your body or your brain to make you start second-guessing your worth. 
It's easy to dismiss these things from the outside looking in. Come on, you get thousands of good comments a day. Why are you focusing on that one bad one? Well, social media is often a concentrated form of life in general. Throughout the day, we have neutral to pleasant encounters at work, the grocery store, the coffee shop, at happy hour, on the elevator. Those often recede into the background noise. But what you don't forget? It's the guy on the elevator who rudely commented on your shabby coat, or the woman who budged in front of you at line in Starbucks and smiled when you called her out on it. I think on some level, we all understand that these are not normal. Being openly rude, it's not okay, and therefore, it's extraordinary in that ugly sort of way. I ask Lisa how she handles these sorts of ugly encounters. How do you deal with some of the negativity that sort of is an ed- it's an inevitable hazard of sort of the job that you have, which is making yourself, you know, I know that you're, you're not always spilling your guts in your videos. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you are, and you yeah. can be shockingly vulnerable in some of your videos. But even just like showing your face for you is a vulnerable moment. How do you deal with some of that negativity? What were some of the specific things that you had to do in order to grow that thicker skin? One is that I had to build my, I have a friend group. We have a group message and having that support system was very important to me. And we're all there for each other. So like if we get a negative comment or something, or if I need to feel better, we'll like all talk and we're all there for each other. Two, I don't look at the comments after a certain amount of time, um, which is sad because I know I'm missing out on a little bit of the community, but for my mental health and for me to continue doing this, I know that I can look at my comments for a little bit, but then after the video has been out for a while and you know it, the algorithm has pushed it to potentially more and more people, then you just know it might not be the best time to look at it. It's just evaluating and being self-aware of how you're feeling at that moment. Like, if I'm having a bad day, it's not a good idea to look into the comments. And so those two things were very important for me to overcome that. But, yeah, uh, it's been an interesting journey, and these are things that you learn. And you also realize at one point your success is just, like, these people leaving these bad comments, they're just projecting and they're having – I don't know, a crappy day for them, but I'm like, well, bye. I'm creating content for a living. This is what I love to do. I get to eat food for a living and share that experience, and it is what it is. The reason you're here in L.A. was to do collaborations with myself and with our mutual friend Cassie Blagalotis. For those of you who don't follow her on YouTube, you should. She's amazing. We'll have her on the podcast uh, one day soon. But this is not the first Uh, kind of collaborative project that you've undertaken. I think the last one I did with you was to share your favorite ramen recipe, instant ramen recipe, which is really, really fun. But what I love about this current collaborative project that you're doing is that you're featuring other AA... Fuck. (laughs) AAPI. AANHPI, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Heritage. Yeah, you're featuring other AANHPI content creators as part of uh, this month, which is AANHPI month. Can you tell us a little bit about what was the thinking behind that and why you wanted to do that? Yeah, it happened probably early April. Um, it was one of those moments where I, my brain wasn't shutting off. But do you get ideas right before you're about to sleep, like fall asleep? Sometimes. Okay. Yeah. I I get them all over the place. Yeah. They're random. Yeah. I was in bed. It was probably like 10 my time and I was ready to fall asleep. And I realized like, you know, May is pretty, you know, just a chill month for me. And I'm going to go out uh, to LA to see some awesome friends and it's AAPI month. And I just like sat up in bed like immediately. And I thought, what if I did like 31 days? Because like you said, I do a lot of series. What if I just did 31 days of highlighting amazing AAPI creators? And at first it was just supposed to be like half where I do collabs in person and half where I cook a dish of theirs in my kitchen and like do it that way. But once I started like thinking more and more about it and letting the idea marinate in my head, I thought this would just be a great way to see everyone, to catch up because we all have such busy schedules And this is forcing us to, like, meet up and catch up. 
some creators I met for the first time. Um, I have a lot of people that we just message, but we haven't had the chance to meet yet. So this allowed for that. And the fact that I can use my platform to highlight them is just fulfilling to me in a way. Um, and selfishly, I get to eat 31 dishes created by other people. Um, so it's, it's, it's been really great. Um, it's been a wonderful experience. And I remember that night I texted Janelle. It's like, I don't know if this is a great idea, but I just thought of it. I know you're still awake, so <laughs> respond to this. And I told her what I wanted to do. Mm. And she's like, I think it's a great idea. I think it's a fantastic idea. And it's been so heartwarming to see all of these content creators on your channel like genuinely excited to share with you their favorite dish or their most comforting dish or yeah. the thing that, that you know fed them when they were little that must be like you said so fulfilling to be a part of eliciting that story from them yeah when I started it off I wanted to make it as easy as possible for the creator um, because I was like I'm gonna come and we're gonna do a collab together but I, I don't want to make it extra work for you and so I thought, I just, whatever dish you want to make, that's totally fine. It doesn't need to have a story behind it. It could just be like something because it's easy to make. But then everyone was cooking their comfort dishes, and then they would tell the story behind it. And, yeah, it just I, – I feel very honored that they would share those dishes with me. Mm, I think that's and with the Internet. Yes. Like people are watching these, and they're really – a lot of people are enjoying the different dishes that are being um, featured in this series. Mm. One of the final questions I wanted to ask you was you've mentioned a couple times throughout our conversation that you're a people pleaser, mm -hmm. you're a big people pleaser, and that you've gotten better about it over time. What do you mean by you've gotten better at it? I think I've gotten better by it by not caring as much. Um, and really through – Therapy helped me so much at identifying why I'm a people pleaser and realizing that just the other person's opinion doesn't hold as much weight or matter as much as I think it does. And I've been able to do more of like, I'm just going to do what I want because it just feels right at that moment. I don't care what people think. It just, it definitely takes time. It's not something, it's not a switch that you can just turn off or on. Um, but that has helped. Without therapy, I know I wouldn't be where I'm at right now. Because it really opened up um, myself to being more like selfish and doing things for myself instead of like trying to please my parents or please other people. And without that unlock or that disconnect, I wouldn't be doing things that I enjoy or for myself. Well, I think that what you say about if I hadn't unlocked that, I wouldn't be doing things for myself. What about this idea that's probably a product of our parents' generation was, so what? You shouldn't be doing things for yourself. You should be doing things for your parents. You should be doing things for your siblings and your family. What about that mentality? Why is that not always the optimal philosophy to adopt in the way that you approach your life? I think... One, we have that in our minds because they've always taught us to respect our elders and to always serve them first. Um, and it's so hard to get out of that. And I I don't know. Like, this is such a tough question for me because I'm still going through it myself. Um, what do you think for yourself? Well, I think that... Thank you for turning this very hard question yeah. back. <laughs> I gotta think about this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I th you know, I'm like you. I have a very overly developed instinct to please everyone around me. And I do think some of it is cultural, but I think that there are probably lots of people, whether they come from a culture of that or just that's just the way they are, where what makes me most uncomfortable is knowing that this person sitting across from me is uncomfortable. If I feel like I'm saying or doing anything that makes you a little fidgety or not want to be in my presence, then I'm 10 times more uncomfortable than whatever discomfort I'm causing you. And so my instinct is always, well, I have to figure out what makes the person across from me uncomfortable and ensure that I do not do those things, at least to not an egregious level. And so that, I don't know how to untrain myself from doing that. But I have also discovered that 
almost everything that I do, and I wanted to ask you this question, which was, you know, who do you think you're trying to please? But you answered that was your your parents. And I feel that way too. Growing up, I didn't know any other thing that pleased me more than pleasing my parents. And it was sort of a perverse kind of pleasure. Like even then I knew this is probably what people feel when they're high on drugs. Mm -hmm. You know, like when I would bring home a good report card or when I, you know, got first chair in violin or whatever it is that I did exclusively to please my parents, I would feel this like physical sensation, almost like I was going to cry and laugh at the same time. Yeah. And I was like, this is not a normal feeling and it's, it feels good, but not in that good way. Mm -hmm. And so I already knew, like, I'm addicted to that the, high. Yeah, that yeah. high of pleasing my, my mm -hmm. mom and my dad. And that's no addictions are good because that means you're not aware of your actions. Mm -hmm. And so I think that was a cue for me that I needed to find a, a, a better purpose in my life. But you know, I, and I've shared this on many different platforms, the conversation I had when I decided to become a full content creator, it was not good. <laughs> and I, I felt the sharpness of disappointing my mom in that moment. And it was very, very unpleasant. But ultimately, I decided that I can't be a good daughter unless I'm a good Joanne. I just can't. And I can't be a good Joanne if I'm constantly obsessed with being a good daughter, if that makes sense. It does. And it's interesting our coping mechanisms because there is, I don't know if there's like a switch for you, but I had to turn off that. Like when I went full on into this, I had to turn off that switch where I cared. It was almost like an on or off thing. Um, obviously, it always seeped through. And it was just like, there's that approval aspect. And I don't know why it's like, because we never got our parents' approval. Or I didn't, so I don't, I don't know if that's like that for you. But so to try to get that high of from or people-pleasing aspect of parents is just, it was unobtainable. So then it was just, I worked harder to get it. Yeah, it was more attractive because it was un uh, unobtainable. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. it's like, what can I do to get to that point? And then at, at some point you reach your breaking point and you're just like, I can't do this. And then you turn on that switch and you're like, I'm going to do what's right for me. And then you just put your head down and you get to work. And that translated, I think, now I'm thinking back to everything else. Like once my videos start taking off, put your head down, do the work, put it in. Next part of life, you just got to do that. You just got to be focused. Do you think that focus actually allows you to have, in some ways, a healthier relationship with your parents? I think so. Um, I love my parents, and it it's taken a while to get to that point. Um, but... It was either the route of no contact or contact at the risk of my mental health and even my physical health. Not like they were abusive or anything, but like the mental health takes a toll on your body. Absolutely. Um, so I was able to find out with my therapist to talk to this. It was the limited contact point. And now we've gotten to the part where we're getting like, it's now like we just see each other and it's, it's, it's a lot better. They know my boundaries. Setting boundaries as well is important. Um... But it really, that was the option. I did not want to have no contact because that makes me really sad to, mm -hmm. if it had to get to that point. But therapy <laughs> helps a ton. <laughs> if you're able to do it and you think you need it, yeah. I, yeah, I can't recommend therapy enough either. I've discovered so many things about myself that I had no idea. I was like lurking around. <laughs> yeah, and that was like, I don't show emotions that much. I smile. Uh, I don't really cry in front of other people or even like at home, I don't find myself crying but talking to my therapist opened up parts of me that I didn't know I had and I was like sobbing in these sessions and I'm like wow there's stuff there yeah I think if you can find a safe space where you can be the ugly cry emotional person mm -hmm. I think that that's important for some people some people I, they don't need that you know they're fully self-aware and they're actualized and they're like I, I can do without the crying but I agree with you I'm one of those persons that I, you know, I ugly cry in front of my therapist. And I'm like, all right, now we've muscled through to the other side and I have illuminated all of these things about myself that helps me to be more self-aware 
um, and allows me to be way more intentional about my choices and my actions, how I interact with people. As we round the corner to the end of this episode, I ask Lisa a question I wanted to ask at the very beginning when she shared with me the story of making that stir-fry dish as a peace offering between her parents. What do you think the role of cooking, whether it's for your neighbor or for your you know, community, your YouTube subscribers, your TikTok followers, what role has that played for you in sort of healing any wounds that you may have carried from you know, when you were little or growing up? I think it is um, giving without the expectation, expectation of anything in return. Like if I can provide value to my viewers by giving them escapism or entertainment, just giving to them, I don't expect anything in return. When I feed my neighbors, I don't expect anything in return. But when they give me food back, that's a sweet bonus. Um, just all these things that I learned to give freely without expecting something in return has been the biggest lesson um, and most fulfilling thing for me um, in building relationships too. I think that's beautiful. Every time I feel lost or directionless in what I'm doing, one of the most helpful things for me is to remember service. You know, like, oh, okay, that I understand. I understand how to serve. And I don't mean that in like a subservient way, mm -hmm. but in a powerful way, like in, in terms of owning my agency and saying, this is something I know how to do. I know how to serve community. I know how to serve my family. I know how to serve my loved ones. And anytime I feel like I'm starting to question my purpose or what am I doing, it's always really comforting for me to go back to, well, the purpose has always been to serve in some capacity, utilize whatever assets I have, whether it's my information, my knowledge, my experience, or my talent to serve a community whatever that community happens to be. So I think when you say, you know, finding your purpose in helping other people while not expecting anything in return, that is the definition of service. Yeah, and there's no approval side to it too. Like I'm just giving you, st well, obviously, <laughs> if I'm <laughs> cooking for you or something, I'm, I'm not like wanting your approval approval, but I don't want you to not like it. But it's not like the approval that I'm seeking from my parents. It's like, I'm giving you this. If you like it, you like it. If you don't like it, you don't like it. I don't need your approval to make myself feel better. It's just me giving you this yeah. makes me feel better. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, what is up next for you? I know that you have rebranded Telehue Food to Chew On This. Is that right? Chew On It. Chew On It. Yeah. And uh, your personal or just Lisa channel is doing amazing as always. Um, but what, what's on the horizon for you? Uh, I love traveling. And now that the world is opening up more, I want to travel more. Um, also, I want to get into creating more long-form content. I'm actually enjoying it. I put it off because it was intimidating, like cooking. Um, I've put this off for a while. And now I'm also just trying to get more comfortable in front of the camera, getting some on-screen presence and trying to figure out that. It's a new challenge. And I like challenges, even though... Um, I said, I'm lazy in some aspects too. So I'm like, I don't want to do it, but I want to do it. And it's been fun working with um, a couple of guys out in Kansas City, learning their process and them learning mine. And also, Are they videographers? Or? Yeah, they're videographers. And it's fun because the new series that I have is where I'm trying to cook a dish within 30 minutes, but doing a spicy challenge at the same time. Oh, wow. So as I'm doing this, they're, you can just see their faces. They're trying to hold in their laughter or like, their empathy for me because I'm like crying and in pain and you can just see like their faces they're trying not to crack up and I'm on this end trying to cook this dish within 30 minutes and it it's really fun um I'm having fun with this series I do know it can be better so every episode that we put out or shoot I'm just like we can do this this and this to make it better and that's like the fun part like getting that better even like building my spice tolerance series in the beginning to now there are just certain things you learn and it's amazing to see those gains, right? Whether it's your tolerance gains or whether it's gaining better proficiency with your camera and, and learning that. And now it sounds like 
gains literally in, yeah. <laughs> in the gym. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited for this, uh, strength training journey for sure. I just feel better. Which That's is great. always a plus. Yeah. Yeah. Feeling better is always good. <laughs> yeah. It's another thing too. Like strength training was intimidating to me until I really learned what that meant. And then now it's also not having to dive in all the way. I'm just taking it step by step because I'm still a noob at it. I'm still learning. Well, and also making sure to take the time to figure out accommodations that work for you. A lot of people don't like going to the gym. All right, well then fine. I'll get some dumbbells and work out at home Mm -hmm. until I feel comfortable enough. And if I never do, that's okay too. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for stopping by my kitchen and cooking with me earlier, our uh, instant ramen tapagetti adventure. Well, thanks for cooking for me. I didn't do anything. <laughs> I just ate, which is well, the I'm best glad part. that you ate it. <laughs> thank you for making it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I had so much fun chatting with you. Likewise. Well, I hope you enjoyed that chat with Lisa Wynn, including the little TV review segment. We really couldn't help but wedge in there. One of my favorite things about this conversation with Lisa was how she continued to learn things about herself as our discussion progressed. That only happens when you let your guard down. And that's the thing about Lisa. I think we can tell that she's been through a thing or two, that her present footing in life, emotionally and otherwise, it was hard earned and continues to be challenged by the people she loves. And yet, She lets it all hang out there, premised on the good faith belief that there are more good people than bad, that the world nets positive when all's said and done. That sort of optimism is an act of courage when at home, cooking up stir fry is the one thing you can do to keep the peace. Thanks everyone for watching and or listening. If you've enjoyed this episode, do me a favor and hit that subscribe button, leave a comment and rating below. Let me know who you want to hear from next. And of course, share this episode with your friends, family, colleagues, or anyone else you think would be inspired by Lisa's story. Until next week, have a wonderful and lovely day.